Hello, welcome to the 13th Man Podcast. I am Abraham Abhishek. UK has 1,270 McDonald's restaurants. It has 1,170 Starbucks. Now get this, during the Second World War, there was a chain of 2,160 restaurants across Britain. So close to twice as many McDonald's that you see today. These were British restaurants, set up as part of the government's wartime efforts to feed the public. This was not even the first iteration of public feeding, as it were, in Britain. In 1917, the Ministry of Food had established something called the National Kitchen. It was a network of more than 1,000 large state-subsidized canteens that ran till 1919. So this was during the First World War. Now, soup kitchens and community kitchens are not uncommon, not unheard of in Britain or outside. But those are usually run by volunteers or religious organizations. What was remarkable about Britain's national kitchen and British restaurants was that they were established by the government in response to an emergency situation. And Britain was not a socialist or communist country where government supported or government run community kitchens were common even during peacetime. So what led to the seemingly sudden appearance of public feeding in Britain during the two wars that it experienced at home? Why did the British government deem it appropriate to cook for its people during periods of food shortage and poverty rather than provide households what they needed to cook for themselves in their own respective kitchens? Why did the national kitchen and British restaurants disappear post-war? And are these concepts, these experiences of any relevance today when much of the world is going through war, conflict, or at the very least a cost of living crisis? Turns out one of the best people to talk to about all this is Bryce Evans, professor of modern world history at Liverpool Hope University, who wrote the book on feeding people in wartime Britain called Feeding the People in Wartime Britain. So I did. So Bryce, for starters, I wanted to ask, what got you into food history? How early on did you uh, decide that food was going to be the lens through which you wanted to look at historical events? Well, Abraham, I started off writing political history. I think that's what everyone grows up learning, political history. And I got to the stage where one of my books was on Ireland during the Second World War. And... It's very interesting politically, but I looked at the story of trade because all wars are, you know, economic conflicts, they're com- conflicts over resources. And really, in wartime, as in peacetime, you need to be providing your people with food and fuel. And that really made me change my focus of history, really, from the politico-centric, you know, the histories of great men to actually what really matters, which is ultimately the productive forces and food being an essential thing. For humanity so that's what got me into food history and um, now I look at the history of food poverty and uh, policy around feeding people in this country uh, in the UK but I also look at the other end of food which is sort of high dining I recently did a book on airline food in the golden age of the luxury airliners so um, all aspects of food really and all different approaches to food I find fascinating You wrote a really interesting article for the BBC History magazine recently about uh, state-subsidized communal dining programs in Britain set up during the two world wars. What was the context that got people thinking that it would be a good idea for the British government to cook for the British people uh, at the time? Well, I suppose there's there's a long history of approaches to public feeding in in Britain um, for much of British history and today, really the government's approach to feeding has just been targeted at the very poor. So if we think back in modern history to Charles Dickens, uh, you know, Oliver Twist, feeding in the famous feeding in the workhouse scene, please, sir, I want some more. Really, the British government in the modern time, that's, that's been its approach, its favorite approach, is to target feeding to the very poor, be that in institutions, workhouses, schools, prisons, the army, And that was always its approach in the colonial context as well. Um, of course, a great stain on British history is, is the history of famine. You know, whether that's Bengal famine in 42, 43, whether that's the great Irish famine in the mid-19th century. But in terms of its own population, it's always been targeted towards the very poorest. But that changes with the context of total war, where the priority 
is uh, an all-encompassing cross-class morale. And there's a big moral panic around the turn of the 20th century about the standard of British army recruits. When Britain effectively you know, loses or comes to a compromise in the Boer War in South Africa, it's a bit of a scandal that a lot of the British recruits are undernourished. And you know, for the greatest nation on earth at this time, this is quite a shocking thing. So that leads to the provision of things like free school meals at the start of the century, but also into World War I, where belatedly, you have the government moving towards rationing, number one, but number two, these massive state-sponsored communal dining schemes, which were huge venues where everybody could get a cheap, nutritious meal. And of course, there's a, there's a, always with you know with the British state, there's a twin, uh, there's a twin sort of goal there. Number one, of course, they want healthy people; it's good for morale. But number two, it also means the production of fit fighting bodies. So there's also the, the more cynical imperial or martial priority there as well. So that happens in 1917, 18 and 19 in the First World War. What really kills communal eating in World War One is the influenza pandemic. We've obviously just come through COVID and a lot of people were talking about the 1918 flu epidemic. And that's what killed communal dining at that time because you can't have huge amounts of people gathering together. Um, but at the time, a lot of people thought this was the future of eating. You know, this was, um, it, I mean, it makes sense. It's a lot more economical. It, 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 you know, concentrates resources. It achieves economies of scale. So at the time, a lot of writers are saying, well, look, this is, the, you know, it doesn't make sense for every street and 100 street, 100 houses in a street in Britain, each of them doing their own thing, eating their own meal. It makes sense that we do this. Um, but of course, then sort of political anxieties creep in. This is the context in 1917 of the Russian Revolution. And there's a lot of anxiety about, you know, the, the threat of Soviet communism. And of course, communal dining is something, well, we see it across, across the world in, in cultures from, um, you know, from India to Latin America is something that people do organically. But in the Soviet Union, it becomes a, a big platform of, of what the state does as well. So Britain shies away from communal dining. With, with the return to peace and the return to the market economy. But it reappears again in World War II. And the, again, it's, a, it's an underdocumented history because in this country, you know, since the 1980s, we've, you know, since Thatcher, we've really been, I think, in Britain obsessed with the notion of private individualism and private initiative and doing things on your own. So the history of communal dining, which was massive, has really been overlooked. I mean, in World War II, um, you know, you had uh, two and a half thousand of these massive sites feeding millions of people uh, cheaply and nutritiously throughout the war, really, really keeping people fed and um, nu nutritiously equipped. And there was a morale purpose there as well. And they continued well into the 50s and 60s. Um, but again, have been sort of airbrushed out of history as we as Britain in, in the last decade or so has moved more towards the food bank as well. Uh, as an approach to feeding people. But yeah, you're right, in, in these two world wars, millions of people were fed through these big social eating schemes. Uh, and uh, if I remember it right, if I've got the figures right, there were like a thousand plus canteens, right, that formed the National Kitchen Service or the National Kitchen uh, between 1917 and 1919. And uh, I looked up the population of, of Great Britain at the time, it was around 39 million. So that makes one communal kitchen for every 39,000 people, sort of. That's a pretty extensive network by any yardstick, right? Like to someone like me who neither lived through that period nor studied it, uh, this seems like a pretty Herculean effort, almost unbelievable. Uh, to you, a historian, does it seem less remarkable given what you know, what Britain was like in those times? Yeah, it, it's, it, I think it is remarkable because I can't help but contrast it. You know, as a historian, you're supposed to be absolutely focused on the period and you can't be a historian and, and apply the standards of today to, to yesterday. But I can't help contrasting it with the situation today in the United Kingdom, where there's roughly, you mentioned there's a, around a thousand plus of these in World War One, two and a half thousand in World War Two. There's currently two and a half thousand food banks in this country. Now that, that's really only arisen in the last 10, 12 years, that that's become a normal thing. And it's a North American approach to feeding. And I can't help but contrast that with what Britain had on the same scale only within living memory with only you know in only 50 60 years ago which was 
two and a half thousand of these sites. And for me, um, they're a much more productive way of feeding people. I think it's much more sustainable. Um, at the time, you had nutritionists in the Ministry of Food who, you know, scientifically studied what people needed to eat to be healthy. Um, they obviously had to mediate that then with popular tastes because nobody wants to eat healthy food 24 seven. But the approach to it, I find quite refreshing because these were deliberately public kitchens. And as you say, Abraham, they would have been on every high street. They would, you know, if you contrast that to today, like in most countries in the West, probably the most ubiquitous sort of restaurant you see is McDonald's. You know, there was, you know, and you see the, the yellow M everywhere. Um, but there was about, you know, that today there's about half that number. It's about, you know, about one and a half thousand McDonald's in the UK now. So if you think two and a half thousand, these would have been all over the place. They would have been very prominent on every high street. And I think it's a remarkable effort to, you know, I, you know, you have to be careful that in Britain, everybody has a lot of nostalgia about World War II. You know, war is not a good thing. It's nothing to be celebrated. So I don't want to lapse into nostalgia. At the same time, you've got, I think, for the only, one of the only times in, in British history where the, the government, for a change, says, look, we need to really address sustainably how to feed people and feed them nutritiously. And I think it actually stands out as a very good thing. Now, the caveat being that that's not the situation in the colonies, as I've mentioned. So it's not a, a, a unanimously positive story. Um, the other thing is, as well, these things, these big state dining institutions were, were not welcomed by private enterprise, which is quite understandable if you're trying to run a, a local restaurant or a grocery business and then suddenly, whoomp, you have a massive juggernaut of a state subsidized communal canteen. It's problematic. And a lot of private enterprise complained at the time that it wasn't fair because these would have been big venues. You know, so some of these would have been former cinemas and swimming pools and big halls. Um, so, it, you know, private enterprise didn't like it. And you can see why, because it, it essentially is the state favoring um, the model of, of feeding people on that scale. Um, but then again, today, you know, the situation where you've essentially got Britain with the British population consumes the most super, um, super, uh, uh, sorry, I'm searching for the terminology, a super processed food in Europe. Um, British consumption habits today are very unhealthy. I think Britain is becoming more and more like the United States, a wealthy country with a lot of poor people in it who eat really, really poor processed food. Um, there was a report today which said that um, the poorest fifth, the poorest 20% of people in the United Kingdom today are actually worse off than people in Central and Eastern Europe, former Soviet states that are now part of the European Union. Now, I don't want to get into Brexit, but um, it's incredible, I think, to contrast the way we do food poverty in this country today, which is targeted at the very poor. And a lot of the time in food banks, people are not getting good food, really. A lot of time it is processed food to that situation in the war where people were being given good, healthy food um, and supported in that mission by the government. Now, I, I just find it quite admirable and remarkable. Yeah. So food banks or the targeted provision of food to people who need it the most, uh, if done right, do you think they could be reasonably effective? They sound like an all right idea. Um, do you think they could potentially be more effective than they are at the moment? And what's holding them back? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a difficult debate around food banks because, you know, nobody, the you know, history, things change. Nobody expects the states to do everything these days. And food banks do represent a very commendable voluntary initiative, you know, where people volunteer their time for free. Um, at the same time, I look at the basic food bank model and I find it really quite demeaning. Uh, in Britain, if in most food banks, you need to produce proof, first of all, of your need for the food. You need to pr produce a referral from maybe a GP or a social worker or probation officer to prove effectively that you're poor enough to receive the food. Now, for me, I don't I think that's a very stigmatizing approach. Um, I don't think that food should ever be subject to that kind of condition. Also, I think. Food poverty, I have to unfortunately say this, and I will sound very cynical, it's become big business. It's become, in the last 10, 12 years in this country, there's been a food poverty marketplace developing. 
um, you have a, a, a private provider, the Trussell Trust, which runs the majority of food banks, not all, but the majority in the United Kingdom. And for me, when I look at that situation and I look at how that ties into the supermarket system as well, which again, is not always very fair towards producers. I don't really see a sustainable system. I think the base, some food banks have cafes attached, some have social eating attached to them, but not many. You know, a lot of people you speak to, a lot of academics, people in my walk of life, they've never been in a food bank. They don't realize how demeaning going into a food bank can be, how uh, you feel defeated before you're through the front door. And then you're asked to produce evidence that you're poor enough to get the food. And the food you get is a lot of the time, you know, it, it's, it, it's packaged, it's, it's super processed. It's what people have donated in the supermarket, it's not good food a lot of the time. It's not good food. And it doesn't address the, the skill gap in terms of people being able to cook and being able to cook healthily. So I, I'm not really a fan of the basic food bank model that, is take, that has taken over this country in the last 10, 12, 15 years. And I find it particularly insulting when you see politicians posing for pictures beside a food bank or indeed Prince William uh, and Kate visiting the food bank and you know, photo opportunities. Well, you know, in one way, okay, you know, that, that is showing solidarity with people in need. On the other hand, is this the most sustainable approach to food poverty? I don't think it is. And, you know, look at the dietary habits of the United Kingdom are not good. And it's a ticking time bomb in terms of the National Health Service in this country, which is already under huge pressure. You know, um, I don't see food banks as addressing all those issues systemically with consumption and diet leading to conditions such as diabetes, cancer, and heart conditions. In fact, I see it as really almost aggravating the problem. And, I, and again, I can't, I don't want to be ahistorical, but I can't help contrast that to the situation in World War II and afterwards where you could go and, you know, really quite cheaply get a good nutritious cooked meal, you know, and eat it socially, which is, I think, just such a basic thing. I mean, anthropologists and sociologists call it commensality. Uh, I would call it social eating or communal dining. It doesn't have to be political. I think it's a basic thing. I think you see it in, through a lot of faiths. A lot of faiths just do this naturally, breaking bread. During the pandemic in, in, in this country, people were amazed, for example, that the Sikh community was going and feeding people in need um, because some of that food poverty network broke down during the COVID pandemic. But the Sikhs, for example, are a, you know, a religious tradition which just does this anyway. I think it's the most simple thing in the world, but I think because of the rampant individualism and consumerism um, of the West, we, we've forgotten that we used to do that as well. Not very long ago. It really wasn't very long ago when we did this. And for me, it's not just preferable nutritiously and in terms of the cost of living, but also socially, mentally. You know, it, it, it's good to talk to people. It's good to you know, commune with people rather than going to a food bank, feeling defeated, getting some crap food, going home, some people not even affording to be able to heat the food. Uh, I hate to sound really depressing here, but you know we have such a bad cost of living crisis in this country at the moment. People can't afford, some people, the poorest people, to heat the food. And I think that in one of the most developed and wealthy countries in the world, that is really quite a shame. Uh, so your call for thinking about the concept of social eating, as it were, in the context of the ongoing cost of living crisis, which is unfolding in Britain, but it is also unfolding in continental Europe and elsewhere in the world, I suppose. Um, do you put this forward as an interesting thought experiment or as a viable you know, policy option? Well, I have had conversations with... Um people in government, people in the devolved governments, Welsh government, Scottish government, but also UK government about this. I've spoken about this extensively. Um, I've also, along with uh, a local MP here, uh, a chap called Ian Byrne. Ian Byrne is the parliamentary lead on something called the Right to Food campaign, which is a UK parliament initiative around feeding people better. And myself and Ian Byrne recently recreated one of these mass communal dining uh, historical communal dining events in Liverpool. Um, we did that with the help of a donation from a professional uh, soccer player, a professional footballer. Again, this is not the ideal model that you rely on philanthropy from the wealthy, because that, again, we're back to the Victorian times. But um, I think we did that quite successfully. There's been quite a lot of research recently coming from Coventry University, 
saying that, and City University in London saying that social eating is inherently better than the basic food bank. So it's not just me and my research that says that, it's, it's backed up by others. And I've had conversations in the last few weeks with um, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, in this country. So I've talked to some senior civil servants there. I've prevent, prevent, uh, presented my research to the UK Parliament. Um, you know, I, I have had a lot of policy conversations about this. Um, things move slowly. What was really encouraging recently is in the UK, there is a government appointed uh, so-called food czar. Uh, this guy is um, a guy called um, Henry Dimbleby, and he's the head of um, a very famous uh, chain of cafes called Leon Cafes in, in the United Kingdom. And he was appointed by the, the government to look at all these issues of food and feeding and how people could be fed better and food poverty in general. And it was really heartening for me to hear him recently in a, in a parliamentary uh, session uh, to back the idea of social eating. He said it was actually a good idea that, that effectively what you have with the private model where you have franchises like McDonald's or like his restaurant chain Leon, that you could viably, if the government wanted to, run as it was in the war. They're effectively franchises, you know. But but they could they weren't um, they were social enterprises. They did they did they had to generate a profit. By the way, uh, it wasn't just throwing money down a hole. They had to generate a profit, but that was put back into the business. So he, as a businessman, as someone from private enterprise, it was really encouraging to hear him recently say to to Parliament that yes, this there is a case. I think is what he said. There is a case for social a social eating franchise sponsored by the government to come back again in this country and he was backed up by another uh, individual from the private from the food sector um, ocado i'm not sure if you have ocado in the netherlands food deliver big food delivery network but the boss of ocado has also said that social eating is the way to go that a franchise social eating approach could be the way to go so i think i hope that at a policy level people are coming around to the argument that social eating is better, more sustainable than the basic food bank. I think that argument is being won. However, how will that translate to policy at a time where the UK economy is shrinking, Brexit is doing a lot of damage, the cost of living crisis is, is mounting? You know, I don't think that there's the will or the money within government to actually fund something like this on the scale at which it was funded in the past, um, which is a shame because I think you know, although voluntary efforts are wonderful and charity is a wonderful thing and people who volunteer at food banks, it's a great thing. I think for me, social justice and long term sustainability around food is inherently preferable to voluntary efforts. Sometimes it's quite annoying when I talk to people in the UK government from DEFRA, that department, that ministry of food, and they kind of say, well, look, if, if, if voluntary organisations are running these sites uh, anyway, because there is a, a, a you know a voluntary network of social canteens in Britain, then why should we step in? Which is a, which is an argument, yeah. But you know it, it's very different to the model in the war when there was a lot of oversight and there was a lot of I think care and attention from from the central state towards the health of the population, uh, and that's something that's been lost I think in this country. Your article, Bryce, apart from laying down the argument for communal eating. Um, it also did a great job of describing what it felt like when when it was happening during the two world wars. So so could you talk a bit about that and also in terms of how different from each other were the two rounds of it? So when it happened during the first world war period, when it was called the National Kitchen, how different was that from the second world war period when it was essentially a network of restaurants called British restaurants? Well, in, in the typical style of, of the British states, they, they stole the model of social eating. from what, what it, Where it had actually sprung up was from women in cities, in working class communities. War always produces inflation. And like today, there was, you know, cost of living was a big issue. So in the big British cities, you had groups of women running these communal canteens. And really, the government takes a look at that and says, well, you know, that's something that we could do. So it effectively steals it off the women who pioneered that with no acknowledgement <laughs> whatsoever. And it appoints three um, celebrity chefs slash food reformers of their day. So if you think about celebrity chefs today on the television, three sort of characters like that, who wrote a book about 
public kitchens. And they were very much striking an almost, uh, uh, you know, sort of futuristic uh, approach to this, that this is the future of dining. This is, there was also a, very, a, a, a sort of condescending tone behind it. You know, the people should be educated in how to eat properly. The people should be educated in, in uh, you know, what is good food, etc. cetera. Um, but from that, the government takes it on. It puts it in the hands. I think one of the, the interesting things about the British approaches to the war is they work a lot of the time with, with, with private enterprise. So they, they, they put it in the hands of a businessman who runs this. He initially wants it to be uh, food served from tram cars. Okay, so tram cars would come along in the tramways and people would go and get the food. Um, he also happened to be the head of a tram company. So there was a vested interest in it for him. But that quickly died out as the model of sitting down and eating just became more sensible, more sensible in terms of economies of scale, uh, getting food centrally, having a, pay, a paid staff as well. Again, this is a key difference to how we do things today. The staff was paid. You had a professional chef who would cook the food. You paid for the food, not a lot, but it wasn't free. So, yeah, you, you get great accounts. Now, you've got to be careful because a lot of wartime propaganda in the press, but you do hear accounts of, say, in London, uh, you know, hundreds of people dining together and not just the very poor people. You get accounts of kids who are so poor they have, they're not wearing shoes, sitting next to women wearing furs. So it, it was a very much a, designed as a public, i.e. cross-class initiative. It wasn't just for, for one class or one class of workers. It was for everybody. Um, these venues would be big, big venues, like I've mentioned, that they take over maybe swimming pools, schools, cinemas, that kind of thing. It was long table dining. It was, a, I'm not sure in the Netherlands if you have the Wagamama franchise, but you know, that sort of model of long table dining. But they went to, I think one of the romantic things is they went to great pains to make it nice. It's an attractive place to go. You know, there would have been tablecloths, flowers, there would have been music from a gramophone. They would have been well decorated. And, you know, this was again, an idea of a lot of the working people in Britain had never, you know, to eat out was just something that the upper classes did. So this was the first, it's a social experiment, really, in many ways. Um, now, there are, it doesn't always work. Um, like I said, it, it, private enterprise gets very annoyed with the system. But 20 years later, when we have World War II, it's taken on in a much bigger way. And of course, in World War II, the reach of the state becomes a lot bigger. Britain almost becomes a really a, a, a wartime socialist country with the central government running everything. So in World War II, they take the model and they expand it in a massive way. Um, but the principle of it being an attractive place to go, again, that's the key difference today. Most food banks today are in back alleys and church halls. You don't really want to go there. You don't want to be in a cold church hall, proving you're poor and getting some you know, pre-packaged cornflakes. You know, these Winston Churchill, who's the prime minister at the time, you know, Churchill, who, who really liked his food, he was a bon viveur, he was used to fine dining. He actually came up with the name British Restaurant. But, you know, the Ministry of Food wanted to call it communal feeding centres. Churchill quite rightly says, nobody wants, nobody looks forward to going to eat in a communal feeding centre. It sounds Soviet, it sounds Dickensian. So we'll call them British restaurants. And again, they went to great effect to, to design the place as well, to have them uh, warm, welcoming, music, um, tablecloths, cutlery. Uh, you had paintings on the wall that were loaned from Buckingham Palace. So you could be sitting down eating a really cheap dinner in you know, a, a really uh, working class area of Manchester or London or Liverpool. And on the wall would be a painting from Buckingham Palace worth, priceless, you know, worth multi-millions. So again, it's difficult to slip into this rose-tinted view of that time. But I think from what I've read, they most of them, not all, but most of them were welcoming places. There were places to talk to people, to meet people, to eat, to come together, to break bread. There was entertainment. It was somewhere which people looked forward to going to. It's the first experience most British people had ever of eating out. It just wasn't something they ever did. Um, now, of course, post-war, when you have post-war migration with the growth of, or, well, also the growth of the supermarket system, but also... Chinese and Italian communities and Indian communities, eating out becomes more normal from the 60s and 70s onwards. But at that time, this was the first experience a lot of people would have ever had of going to a restaurant. And I think it worked for its time relatively well. What was the food like? 
it would have been now when we recreated we, we recreated these uh recently and um a couple of years ago i recreated them across the country and it was wonderful to recreate them because, because look history changes and and one of the ones we recreated a couple of years ago uh we did them all over the uk we did one in nottingham in the pakistani community community center so all the food was um asian food which was wonderful now of course during the war you didn't have that kind of cuisine you didn't have that kind of palate the, the english palate was very bland really so the food really would have been um you know think of typical english roast dinner you know you have meat spuds vegetables gravy that kind of thing but to most people at the time that was a square meal the um the, the scientists at the ministry of food of course wanted everyone to be eating very very healthy to be eating vegetable based soups you know very you know good foods super foods that kind of thing but they had to very quickly change those plans because you know in the context of the war in britain when people have been bombed out of their houses people want comfort foods you know people want to eat pies and fish and chips that you don't you don't if you've been bombed out of your house you don't particularly maybe look forward to a, you know a, a vegan um salad or stew or something so it, it was a compromise between the sort of the, the twin aims of healthy eating and um and sort of popular taste but one of the things that was insisted upon was that number one food had to conform to a price structure so so you couldn't charge more than a certain rate for the food and number two to correspond it to today in britain today one of the sort of hallmarks of the national health service they have something called the eat well plate which basically says that about a third of your plate should be uh green leafy vegetables that that kind of thing so they conform to that basically so but you could you know it would have been pies and stews and um you know good hearty traditional english food that kind of thing but with a lot of veg on the side as well um so again hearty food traditional quite well quite bland to today's taste it is quite bland and traditionally english but crucially it did have you know a healthy component as well and of course desserts oh. desserts would have been there as well so you have your tea and cake and your all your typical stodgy english desserts uh there as well so yeah if you think traditional english fare is is what it would have been yeah uh at what point did they start winding down at 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 what point did uh, the british restaurants start closing down start fading away well they really died well first of all it's the end of the war and with the end of the war you always have to in any country you know really in in many ways in wartime societies everybody again we had this with covid everyone's pulling together there's a lot of efforts together and then when that finishes with the return of peace everybody goes back to being you know a, a privatized individual and all the rest so they start to decline after 45 at the end of the war but remember in britain there's still a britain still has a rationing system way into the 1950s right way up until 1954 so the british restaurants in world war 2 were always designed to work in tandem with that rationing system you you for you know your average british person in world war 2 your basic food you would go to the grocer and you give it you had a coupon book and you'd be given your basics as your ration so these were always designed as a complement to that somewhere where people could eat out and enjoy themselves so they kind of work in tandem so really they continue well well into the 50s um but then they start to die out um i think the nature of consumer capitalism changes in this country the like i was saying eating out the options of eating out needs to be much more palatable and you know different cuisines coming in like i mentioned indian chinese italian etc um but also i think the supermarket becomes a big thing uh, in britain in world war 2 again so that's sort of eliminating in some ways the need for this kind of model also you know in war time governments are willing to pour money into these kind of things because they're good for morale post war again the, the state says look it's not really our responsibility to be feeding people so they start to, to really decline by the early 50s some of them limp on into the 60s and 70s in certain contexts in certain cities but really by by the 60s and 70s um they're gone um and i think then of course you know you have the years of thatcherism in the 80s where where the notion of you know communal dining becomes really passé i mean it's a bit like ugh why would you want to go eat with other people in a sort of institutional kind of school canteen kind of environment which is quite ironic actually because margaret thatcher's father used to run one of these british restaurants himself um but they you know the ethic of eating together very much went against you know the collectivism 
went very much against that Thatcherite ethic of, of uh, private, privatized individualism. But I think in this country, we, we perhaps are starting to reevaluate that now. Um, and the cost of living crisis, like you mentioned in Europe as well, I think people are turning more to these kind of things. We also have in this country something called food pantries, which are, uh, again, a little bit different to, to the food bank, but you have sort of membership. But I'm a member of a local pantry here. So, again, you don't really have to prove your poverty in those places. You go in there, it, they do charge you for food, but it's it's fairly cheap. So there's quite a number of initiatives these days in Britain. The food bank gets all the headlines, but you've got food pantries, you've got um, uh, community kitchens, that kind of thing. Um, in, in Glasgow, actually, there's a massive one of these, which is run on a voluntary basis in London as well. Um, so I think they are making a quiet comeback. But my argument to the UK government has been, well, really, I think it's in the, the government's interest to, to put money behind this, you know, because, you know, if the long term impact of poor diet upon health, which ultimately the state picks up the tab for eventually. But, you know, trying to wring money out of governments, as I'm sure you know, Abraham, is a very, very hard thing to do. Uh, but what do you think specifically are the, the disincentives for the government to um, sort of get behind this idea or at least uh, try to bring it back? Yeah, well, I think it would, it, you know, these days people have, you know, if you think in World War II, you know, most people had never eaten out in their life. Um, you didn't really have a supermarket system. The local grocer was where you went for your food. Today, it's completely different. You know, people are used to calling in food from delivery or just eat, etc. They're used to eating out. Uh, you have much more choice as a consumer. Now, you know, consumer choice doesn't mean healthy choices. People are still eating not good food. But I suppose the government would argue that people at least today have the choice to, to make the decision to eat healthily that you know if you want to eat healthily you can it's difficult in western society because there's so much sugar and everything we eat for example but I, I think the government would, would say look the marketplace is there and people can avail of that and eat very healthily if they want to so the other argument against it would be again why should the government um intervene in something like feeding people which is something that they i, I think they would argue that it should be up to the individual um, and maybe, you know, historically, we've moved past the period in which the state intervenes in such a massive manner like this. Um, again, you know, one of the disincentives would be the fact that communal dining is a feature of authoritarian societies. It's really big in the Soviet Union. It's really big in Nazi Germany. Not so big in fascist Italy, but, you know, as a model, some people, I think, still associated with uh, the evils of authoritarian communism or fascism, effectively. Um, so again, it would depend on the political will. Is the political will there to do that? Um, I, I don't think it is uh, currently from the current UK administration, but I think perhaps we're looking at a change of government in this country, maybe in the next two years. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in the Labour Party who if the polls are to be believed, we'll be coming to power in two years, uh, who are very much in favour of this kind of approach. So, so the approach may change, but, but a big disincentive would be you don't want to alienate or annoy, number one, voluntary initiatives, but number two, private enterprise. One of the great things about Britain in World War II is that, OK, you've essentially got a system of state socialism, but they work with private enterprise really well. They, they, the guy they appoint as Minister of Food in World War II is a, is a private retailer. Uh, a lot of the propaganda is coming from professional admin. You know, if you had, again, that symbiotic relationship between the best of private enterprise and the state, I think it could work well. In my discussions with the UK government, I've said, look, you know, look at, people like to go to Wagamama. They like, to, one thing that's really big here is like Ikea. People love to go, some people just go to Ikea, not for the furniture, but for the canteen, you know, because they love the, the Swedish meat rolls, et cetera. It, that, that, these are effectively a similar canteen model. So, so in talking to DEFRA, I've said, look, you know, get goodwill from private enterprise on board um, in terms of design, in terms of their know-how. You know, I would have no problem with that. And the British government in World War II relied heavily on private enterprise. But again, um, you have to have that goodwill. You have to have that sense as well that uh, something like this wouldn't be taking too much market share. Uh, from private individuals and, and private food retailers who, let's be honest, have had a really tough
couple of years with COVID as well. So it would have to be very delicately done, I think, if it was to be revived. Yes, absolutely. And as you mentioned, even if uh, uh, the incoming government, the next government were to, you know, in Britain or, you know, governments elsewhere uh, uh, in the world, were to get behind the idea uh, of uh, setting up and promoting communal dining systems. Um, I find it difficult to picture current national governments, not just in Britain, uh, but also in continental Europe. Uh, I find it difficult to visualize them being willing to or being able to uh, mobilize such large scale sort of emergency kind of efforts. There seems to be a preference for providing financial assistance. So like, uh, you know, cash transfers. And one sees more and more that things are done through the private sector, as you mentioned. Um, and increasingly, it is not considered prudent that government organizations actually get into implementing interventions. So uh, do you think there's something to this impression of mine? Or uh, do you think these are just my biases as a person born in the 1980s who's never lived through a warlike situation and who has not uh, studied history as you have? No, I think I think you're you're right, and I think it's very hard to imagine <clears throat> in Western Europe, for example, a high street which would contain a you know state subsidised canteen. But I suppose it would be a question of getting the branding right. If if uh, the you know I think it, if they were implemented today, they would have to be competitive. They would have to be competitive in a marketplace, uh, and so if it was branded correctly, if it had the right. Um, structures and management structures behind it i think it could work but you're right i think the the favored method is is giving people money it is essentially the welfare model of, of targeting people uh, through uh, money transfers etc the problem with that is you know, people don't make the right choices um it, you know it, it it's in some ways the the dilemma is we, you know the big the big um elephant in the room here is is climate change and you know if the entire world adopted Western models of consumption, uh, Western models of lifestyle, including uh, usership of cars, including the way we eat, etc. This would only and will only aggravate climate issues. So I think more broadly, more generally, I'm not sort of advocating for, you know, a, a, a sort of socialist future here, but we need to be thinking more ecologically about things. I think the very fabric of life has to change within this century if we're to properly address climate change. And I think we have to think creatively and be historically informed in our creative thinking um, about how to approach this. And if you look at things like cost of living, but also environmental impacts of consumption, it does actually, as they were saying 100 years ago, make so much sense financially and in terms of ecology, sustainability and the environment. For, for people to eat collectively with, it, with this kind of model. Now, I just think we need to be shifting towards that kind of thinking um, alongside a different, you know, suite of different measures. We need to be thinking uh, ecologically. And, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, I'm a child of the 80s as well. And um, I've never known a world war. I'm very much inured in consumer capitalism and my individual choice. Um, and I never thought in my lifetime I would see the return of state sponsored communal dining. But we effectively had that in this country during COVID, not in the same way as I've been describing, but we had a, a period during COVID where the, the now Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, uh, when he was Chancellor, funded um, to a huge expense the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which was where private restaurants were, were given money to encourage people to eat for a certain price, a certain menu. Now, that's not terribly different to what we're describing. That's a form of state-sponsored communal dining. I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. Of course, you're right to point out that was during the emergency conditions of COVID, but maybe it just shows that some of the things we take for granted in terms of the structure of our world and our con consumption habits are adaptable to change and are liable to change. At the same time, I'm not an evangelist for, for this model. Um, you know, there were problems within it. It wasn't always great food. Uh, you do get some accounts where people said, look, this feels grindingly institutional, you know, it feels like school canteen, that kind of thing. But we sh surely have to think sort of more holistically about our, about everything really from farm to fork when it comes to the food system, about giving a f fair deal to producers, about um, ensuring the poorest people are fed properly, about ensuring everything is done sustainably in the interest of the environment. 
And if we are to think like that, and the big thing is to address climate change, then I can imagine something like this in some form uh, reappearing. Uh, in many ways, like I said, it did, it did for a year or so in Britain, which I never expected would happen. So, um, but yeah, 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 I think you're right there. You put your finger on it in terms of the, the notion of emergency. Uh, and maybe it's a human trait. You know, it's only when people are, you know, in the mindset of an emergency that these kind of measures seem to be taken. Um, and then when the emergency is over, well, we just revert to uh, normal, um, unsustainable and quite greedy modes of production and consumption. Um, maybe we need to start thinking in the context of a climate emergency about how to fundamentally shift a lot of these, uh, a lot of these systems we rely on for our food. I forgot to bring this up during our conversation, my bad, but it is worth mentioning that the British restaurants were actually able to turn a profit for a greater part of their existence. For the financial years 1942-43 and 1943-44, their net profits were to the tune of 3.5 and 6 million pounds in today's money. I suspect that in this day and age, it will be difficult to discuss Britain's experience with wartime public eating or the concept of public eating in general without evoking extreme reactions from those who tend to shout down the slightest bit of government involvement as deep state overreach, as well as those who would like the government to take charge of every last thing. I hope we can look at it as just the experiment that it was and the lessons it might hold. It was nice to learn that Bryce is talking to politicians and government officials and they're discussing whether and how some of those lessons could offer specific pointers for present day Britain. That process is important and it might hold important lessons for the rest of the world as well. There was something that Bryce mentioned that lingered and stayed with me as uh, someone born and educated in India. The fact that the rather massive network of British restaurants appeared in Britain around the time the Great Bengal Famine was playing out in India, a British colony at the time. There are definitely connections between the two, but perhaps that's another conversation for another time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.